Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, pandemic version of the release of our annual report. Um, I decided to do this press conference um, virtually to avoid putting additional strains on the Legislative Assembly staff and operations and to make things as safe and as easy as possible for you journalists. So uh, no need to leave the comfort of wherever your laptop is parked. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. I'm sure you're used to these by now more than I am. And uh, here's hoping that the uh, technology doesn't fail us. Merci de votre patience, votre compréhension pour ce nouveau format de conférence de presse. Mais j'imagine que nous sommes tous habitués maintenant. I have a few opening remarks to make about the report that I'm releasing today. Then I'll be happy to take questions from journalists who are joining this video conference. Uh, Linda has a list and we'll call on you when the time comes. Uh, je serais ravi de prendre vos questions après quelques remarques. Uh, Linda a la liste de journalistes. Elle va faire le tour de rôle uh, pour les questions à la fin. As I say in my message in this report, everything changed for us and the world in March. But I want to underscore that it had already been an historic year for us up to that point, as we assumed responsibilities for two former offices of the legislature, the French Language Services Commissioner and the Provincial Advocate for Children and Youth on May 1st of 2019. So we spent much of the previous year adapting to that challenge. The expansion of our mandate into two brand new areas, children and youth in care and French language services. So it has been a year of change and adaptation, but the common thread in these developments is that they presented opportunities for our office to help more people in new ways. To do what we have done for 45 years, helping whenever we can to make sure the public services work as they should. This report details another productive year of fulfilling our responsibility in enhancing governance by promoting transparency, accountability and fairness in government and in the public sector. Ce rapport décrit une année productive où nous nous sommes acquittés de notre responsabilité de renforcer la gouvernance en promouvant la transparence, la responsabilisation et l'équité au sein du gouvernement et du secteur public. For example, we raised concerns about conditions in Ontario correctional facilities as complaints from inmates reached a record 6,000. In the two systemic investigation reports that we released, we highlighted serious issues with transparency and accountability at the municipal and school board levels, and all of our recommendations were accepted. When the coronavirus hit, we, like the rest of the province, were thrown into a new reality, and we had to adapt. We had to adapt our operations. We had to pivot, just like so many other institutions, responding to thousands of public complaints while working remotely ensuring that the concerns of vulnerable people are heard and continuing to resolve complaints and pursue and launch investigations. But ombudsmen are premier problem solvers. Those abilities have enabled us not just to readjust our operations and remain accessible, they've enabled us to contribute to positive change and find solutions that benefit citizens and the agencies that serve them in these challenging times. Les ombudsmen, les protecteurs des citoyens sont des solutionneurs de problèmes de premier plan. Ces capacités nous ont permis non seulement de réajuster nos opérations et de rester accessibles, mais aussi de contribuer à des changements positifs et de trouver des solutions, des, des solutions bénéfiques aussi bien pour le public que pour les organismes qui les servent en ces temps difficiles. So to everyone watching this, I encourage you to review some of the stories in this report about the many ways that we've helped people with complaints, big or small, complex, mediocre, simple. They might remind you of problems that you've experienced with public sector bodies yourselves. And if they do, we're here for you. We stand by ready to help. If there's one lesson that we can draw from this pandemic, it's how much citizens rely on their public services. Si elle ne sont attirées de cette pandémie, c'est à quel point les citoyennes et les citoyens comptent sur leur service public. My observation is that the public service responded admirably in most instances to the challenges posed by the pandemic. In our interactions with the public sector, we see public servants doing their best to serve and meet people's needs. 
However, given the scale of the pandemic and the speed with which the virus spread, there were bound to be gaps in responses. They could not all be perfect. Therefore, if this report has a theme, it is the importance of having robust oversight of public services. It's about ensuring that the rights and the voices of the vulnerable are not overlooked. Whether they're inmates in correctional facilities, young people in foster homes, the frail and elderly in long-term care, or French-speaking Ontarians seeking emergency health information in their language. Par conséquent, si ce rapport est un thème, c'est l'importance d'une surveillance vigoureuse des services publics. Le but est de veiller à ce que les droits et les voix des personnes vulnérables ne soient pas négligés. Qu'il s'agisse des détenus dans des établissements correctionnels, des jeunes en foyer d'accueil, des personnes frêles et âgées dans les foyers de soins de longue durée, ou des ontariennes et ontariens à la recherche de renseignements sur les services de santé d'urgence dans leur langue. Before I take your question, I just want to give a shout out. That's my grad. For many of us, the resilience and dedication that they have displayed confirms the high degree of professionalism that they are in. Um, All of this are directed to All right. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with audio here. Um, I and I, I got a message from someone too. Now everyone is muted, so that shouldn't be affecting it. Um, but please bear with us. Um, some of what I couldn't hear some of what you said towards the end. Um, I'm going to start with the, go through the reporters just in a list. If you don't have a question, uh, just uh, let us just say so and we'll move on to the next person. Um, I'm going to start with, oh yes, I'm getting messages that <laughs> audio, we had an audio problem. We are working on it. All right. Um, we are working on it. For those of you, if it may help if you turn off your video um, reception, I'm not sure. I'm going to give it this a try though. Uh, and uh, Sean Jeffords, um, if you are there and you are ready to ask a question, can we start with you, Sean from Canadian Press? Oh, can you hear me okay, guys? I can hear you. Great. Paul, um, I just wanted to ask you specifically about the. Uh, COVID-19 related uh, complaints. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us, is that, are those complaints that basically range from the start of the pandemic until the end of March and are they across a number of sectors or are they specifically cropping up in certain places like long-term care? Could you tell us about that? No, they, they, they run the gamut. They go across uh, our whole jurisdiction, uh, you know, Examples, um, children in care, there, was, there were complaints about accessibility to visit some of the youth in care, given the, the, um, the lockdowns and the visitation. Uh, so we got complaints about visitation and, and limits to accessibility. We got the same complaints regarding um, long-term care. In education, we got complaints about remote learning because kids were from home and whether there was a sufficient communication um, or support for, uh, for because of uh, providing instruction to their kids. Um, trying to think of, you know, Service Ontario uh, being closed. People were finding uh, that they were experiencing delays to get permits and certificates, that kind of thing. So the, 
you know, the lockdown and the, um, the change in operations for the public sector and for government uh, has affected people across the board. And just to be clear, that that um, those 800 complaints, that is encapsulating um, just a snapshot there in March until the end of the fiscal year, correct? Right. Okay. Right. And if I might just uh, sneak in one more question about uh, the complaints about the correctional um, facilities across the province. It sounds like you and your staff experienced and saw um, some, as you say, disturbing things. Can you tell us about uh, what you saw when you went into these facilities and, and what you're trying to communicate to the public today? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I quite often get it asked every year, what's, what's the most egregious complaint you got or what's the most uh, troubling situation you dealt with? I have to say that maybe in the four years that I've been ombudsman, the most disturbing thing I've seen uh, and the most appalling conditions I've observed are the Thunder Bay Jail. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's heart-wrenching to see the conditions uh, in which those, those, those inmates are living. And I think it's, it's a testament to the management there because they're, they're keeping a lid on things and the inmates recognize that. So when you have the you know, management and the inmates calling for the same thing, calling for better conditions, uh, you know that there's a serious problem there and the conditions there are just atrocious. So we've been in communication with the uh, Solicitor General, the Ministry of the Solicitor General. I know they have a plan. Um, you know, they're working on building a new jail, uh, but we remind them that time is of the essence and they keep us up to date with development and, and how the, the plan is moving forward. But um, it, was, it was really troubling. I, was, I have to say I was shaken when I left that, that visit at Thunder Bay Jail. Um, one of the things that kept me up at night when the pandemic first struck and we had to transition to working from working remotely was our accessibility to inmates because there was nobody in the office to handle our 1-800 line and there was nobody there to take the uh, blue, le blue letters that the inmates can send us. And so we scrambled and, and we had a good collaborative discussion with the uh, Solicitor General's ministry and we set up a temporary phone system uh, that initially involved um, you know, calling cards and cell phones, that kind of thing. Um, which was good, but not good enough. And so what we've done since then is we've set up five dedicated 1-800 numbers that inmates can call us collect uh, because when they were using the calling card, when they had the calling cards before, they were not using them to call us. They were using them to replace family visits and stay in touch with family. And that's understandable. So uh, we really, really worked hard the first month or two of the pandemic to, to ensure accessibility to inmates. And, and we've done that. And the, the call volumes are up and, and they show that. And so we're able now to intervene into situations. And we have examples in the annual report of you know, people feeling threatened and we can contact the sergeant at the correctional facility. Uh, people are talk, calling us to complain about um, protocols and protective equipment, that kind of thing. And we can inform ourselves, we can get have concrete discussions and get a lot of those situations resolved. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. All right. I'd like to call on uh, Rob Ferguson next from the star. Oops. Where are you? I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? I can. You can hear me? Good. Um, I just wanted to um, um, get into the nursing home situation. You announced the invest investigation June 1st. I wonder what you have found so far, which way it's leading, anything you can tell us about how that's progressing and, and what concerns you? Well, I can't comment too much on an ongoing investigation. What I will say is that um, I knew other people were going to be looking into this area, but when I read the uh, Canadian Armed Forces report, um, because we don't have direct oversight of, of long-term care homes, that's the patient ombudsman that has that responsibility, um, you know, we didn't have a line of sight into these uh, nursing homes and, and the complaints that we got, we would refer to the patient ombudsman. But that Canadian Armed Forces report gave us an insight into, into what was going on there. And I, I just said, we have to contribute our expertise to this situation. Um, you know, we're experts at administrative investigations. We do have oversight over the two ministries of long-term care and of health. And so um, that's when I decided we had to do an investigation and, and to look into this. Um, what we'll do, you know, what I can tell you in a general, our general practice is to, is to look at best practices. We're going to look at Australia. We're going to look at British Columbia. We're going to look at New Brunswick. We're going to look at other uh, jurisdictions around the world to see how, how things were handled there. And, um, 
you know, that's the value. That's the value we seek to add. It's not just identifying problems. It's proposing feasible solutions. that are going to make things better in the future. So I can't really get into the details, although I can tell you we're, um, we're having great conversations with, with stakeholder groups, with interested parties. Uh, people are providing us with, with a ton of information. And, uh, and we have a great collaboration with the patient ombudsman to make sure that the right complaints go to the right place. So we're exchanging information, keeping each other in the loop. And, um, and um, we'll keep you posted. All right, just, just to follow up on that, if I can, um, how long do you think this will take and when do you anticipate reporting? Yeah, that's always a tough question. <laughs> we get that question all the time and we don't know how long it's gonna take, you know, um, when we start an investigation. Um, we're gonna try and, and expedite it. You know, we're trying to keep the scope very, very focused, um, avoid scope creep and avoid getting bogged down. So uh, we're going to complete it as fast as is feasible and as, as responsible to get to the bottom of this. Um, but I can't, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't give you an estimate on, on, on timelines. I get myself into trouble every time I do that because then if you miss it by a month, uh, pe people get upset. So I, I don't know, but we're moving full, full, full speed ahead on this. And as you can appreciate, an investigation during these times takes a little bit longer than it might normally take. Uh, interviews have to be set up by, by video conference. The public servants that we're you know, getting information from uh, are working remotely. And the witnesses that we have to interview also be virtually. So we're gonna do it as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd, I'd like to do, uh, go to one more person in English and then we'll move to some questions in French. Um, uh, Laura Stone from the Globe, can I uh, unmute you? Yes, <laughs> I'd like to go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Laura. So I wanted to ask also about uh, long-term care. You say in your report that you received more than 400 complaints about hospitals, 64 complaints about long-term care. But you also say that that's not in your jurisdiction and you referred them to the patient ombudsman. You also say that there wasn't a patient ombudsman. So is there not a critical gap here of action for people who are making these complaints during this time? Well, there was no patient ombudsman, but the office was still functioning. There was a director uh, filling that role on an interim basis. And so, um, work was still being done, complaints were still being processed. So, you know, we, we, we weren't referring those um, complaints into a vacuum, into a, you know, we weren't throwing them off to the cliff. There were, there were people there actually uh, working the files. Um, so we, and there now is an, an ombudsman in place. I look forward to meeting with her, but I can tell you we have a great collaboration set up. As I said, we're exchanging information, making sure that the right complaints, complaints about the ministries come to us, uh, complaints about, um, the actual service within the long-term care homes, the patient experience are going to the patient ombudsman. And in addition to that, of course, they're referring us uh, anything that touches on French language services as well. Um, so that's, a, that's beneficial to us. And can you respond to some concerns from um, from help, from those working in the healthcare sector who have spoken to your office that your investigation will be too narrow that it shouldn't that it's only focused on COVID-19 whereas there are some systemic issues that need to be looked at and you're telling them that that is not within your mandate. Well you know you just heard Rob Ferguson asking me how long the investigation is going to take if we did an investigation into the whole system going back 30 years it would probably be a four or five year investigation so what we're trying to do is bring positive change to the areas of primarily inspection and uh, of um, standards and inspection standards and compliance. So uh, I think that that's what's called for right now. And if other avenues open up um, and we notice things that merit um, further investigation later on, we'll do it. But I think what is really essential right now is, is to get to the crux of the problem. Um, people died in long-term care during the pandemic. Why did it happen? How can we uh, prevent that from happening again? That's our focus and that's what we're moving forward on. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, alors, en, ensuite, uh, quelques questions en français. Uh, Natasha mcdonald Dupuy, uh, êtes-vous là? Oui, bonjour, M. Dubé. Allez-y. Bonjour, Mme Dupuy. Bonjour. Um, donc, 
Seulement 5 des 92 pages du rapport portent sur les services en français sans pas y avoir de recommandations. Euh, plusieurs des mises à jour avaient déjà été publiées dans une, un communiqué de presse au début du mois de mai. Donc, je sais que vous écrivez que la commissaire Burke va publier un rapport annuel séparé plus tard cette année, mais vous n'avez pas peur de laisser les franco-ontariens, les francophones sur leur faim un peu avec votre rapport? Mais pas du tout, pas du tout. Je pense que c'est six pages consacrées à l'unité des services en français, puis je pense que c'est plus que les autres unités. Euh, écoutez, ça, je pense que ça démontre l'importance qu'on accorde aux services en français au sein de notre bureau. La commissaire va avoir son propre rapport annuel, mais entre-temps, on a fait une mise à jour de, comme j'ai dit, six pages de notre rapport annuel euh, avec, les, avec les constats, avec les, avec, les réussis, avec les réussites de la commissaire jusqu'à date. Euh, je pense que c'est plutôt un bilan positif. Euh, depuis juste cinq mois, le commissaire a eu un impact à la, euh, provoquer des changements positifs et on avait hâte de, de partager ces nouvelles-là. Et euh, en temps et lieu, la commissaire va publier son propre rapport, faire son propre point de presse et euh, on, on travaille vers des résultats toujours. Uh, OK, ben on, on continue en français. Émilie uh, uh, Pelletier, uh, avez-vous des questions? Oui, bonjour, vous m'entendez? Euh, le droit? Oui. Okay. Bonjour, M. Dubé. Bonjour. Euh, il y a une section dans le rapport où vous affirmez que la commissaire au service en français s'est assurée que les renseignements de santé publique essentiels sont communiqués aussi en français, y compris lors des points de presse du premier ministre. Euh, mais ça a pris plusieurs semaines pour que la traduction en simultané soit offerte. Puis encore aujourd'hui, il y a toujours un délai de quelques minutes dans la publication des communiqués de presse, des données quotidiennes sur la COVID. Euh, Jusqu'à présent, chaque fois qu'on passe à une nouvelle étape ou à une nouvelle phase du déconfinement, les documents techniques ne sont offerts qu'en anglais. Euh, donc, les journalistes francophones doivent faire eux-mêmes la traduction pour pouvoir partager les informations essentielles. Comment est-ce que vous expliquez ça? Je ne suis pas au courant des problèmes techniques de tout ce qui se passe en, en arrière-plan. Je sais que le commissaire est vigilant et engagé avec, euh, que ce soit le président de la Chambre, que ce soit le, le ministère, que ce soit le bureau, de, le bureau du cabinet. Euh, elle a eu beaucoup, beaucoup d'entretiens pour s'assurer qu'il y ait une, une traduction simultanée des points de presse. Euh, et elle va continuer de le faire. Donc, euh, elle est là pour assurer que les, euh, les francophones reçoivent des, des renseignements importants euh, dans leur langue et ça va continuer. Mais je ne peux, peux pas vous expliquer les, euh, les technicalités, qu'est-ce qui se passe en arrière avec la diffusion et tout ça. Je ne suis pas en mesure d'expliquer ça. Est-ce que j'ai droit à un, un follow-up? Bien sûr. OK. Euh, si la commissaire euh, va publier son propre rapport annuel, euh, en quoi son travail change comparativement à un poste de commissaire euh, indépendante? Elle est une commissaire indépendante d'abord. Il euh, n'y a, a, a pas d'institution plus indépendante que le bureau de l'Ombudsman. Euh, Kelly Burke, comme commissaire, travaille au sein du, du bureau de l'Ombudsman. Donc, elle est indépendante de, de, dans tous les aspects qu'elle doit être indépendante. Elle doit être indépendante du gouvernement. Elle doit être indépendante des, des, des groupes d'intérêt ou des lobbyistes. Euh, elle doit tirer ses propres conclusions, euh, faire ses propres recommandations. Donc, elle est indépendante dans tous les sens. Et nous sommes sur la même équipe. Et Kelly et moi, nous tenons les services en français à cœur. Euh, dire qu'elle n'est pas indépendante, c'est comme dire que Guy Lafleur aurait dû être indépendant de Larry Robinson. Nous sommes sur la même équipe. On travaille vers le même but. Donc, euh, j'ai perdu le fil de, 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 de mes pensées pour votre question, mais est-ce que vous pouvez répéter la question encore? Je pense que... Pardon, on m'avait laissé sur, euh, sur mute. Euh, okay. ben, je veux juste savoir, en fait, c'est quoi la différence de, de, du travail de Mme Burke à celui de M. Boileau euh, l'année dernière? Il n'y a pas de différence de le travail. C'est juste qu'elle travaille sur une autre plateforme. Elle travaille au sein d'un organisme avec une, euh, un mandat plus vaste, une juridiction, un champ de compétences plus vaste. Donc, elle a plus d'opportunités. Elle a les mêmes pouvoirs que l'ancien commissaire. Il n'y a rien à changer dans la loi. 
Euh, sauf que maintenant, elle travaille au sein d'un organisme qui est une plus vaste juridiction. Euh, la commissaire est à la table lorsqu'on discute toutes sortes de choses. Je vous donne l'exemple de notre enquête sur les euh, foyers de soins de longue durée. Elle est là. Elle a accès à tous les renseignements. Et si jamais il y a un enjeu qui touche les services en français qui est identifié ou cerné, elle va être vigilante et elle va agir en conséquence. Euh, vous avez, euh, et puis la commissaire actuelle est en train de transformer le bureau de l'Ombudsman. Il certain que nous sommes toujours aux aguets pour les, euh, les enjeux qui touchent les services en français. Vous avez un exemple à la page 70 de notre rapport. Il y a une dame qui, fait, qui, qui a fait une plainte concernant la commission de sécurité de l'emploi. C'était une plainte à l'Ombudsman. Euh, mais en traitant cette plainte-là, nous avons constaté que les formulaires en question n'étaient pas disponibles en français. On a eu des entretiens avec le ministère et avec la commission et ça a été changé et les, euh, les formulaires en français ont été créés. Ça, c'est grâce au rôle, au, à, à l'envergure, au statut que le commissaire a maintenant au sein du bureau de l'Ambassade. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to go back to English questions, but first I made a mistake. Uh, Natasha avait une question de follow-up. Uh, Natasha, uh, allez-y. Super, merci. Um, oui, je voulais vous demander, um, on, on vient d'avoir une réaction de M. Boileau, justement, par rapport à votre rapport. Um, puis, il dit qu'il veut rectifier une, une fausse, là, je, je le cite, il dit qu'il veut rectifier une fausseté véhiculée euh, depuis le transfert, il n'y a jamais eu de système automatisé de traitement de plainte au commissariat. Tous les plaignants et toutes les plaignantes ont toujours eu un contact individuel avec le personnel, même avec le commissaire directement. J'aimerais savoir si vous voulez réagir à, à sa réaction. Écoutez, euh, euh, l'étude qu'on a faite des opérations, il, y avait, il existait un portail électronique euh, pour recevoir des plaintes. Et nous avons parlé aux plaignants aussi euh, qui nous disaient qu'ils euh, n'étaient toujours pas contactés par l'ancien commissariat. Écoute, ce qui est important maintenant, c'est qu'est-ce qui existe? Est-ce que, est que ça dessert bien les francophones? Je vous dis oui. Je vous dis que notre expérience depuis 45 ans de traiter des plaintes, de, de trouver des solutions, vous allez voir les chiffres dans notre rapport annuel, 26 000 points, euh, plaintes résolu, 64 résolu dans deux semaines. C'est notre expertise. Nous allons appliquer cette expertise-là euh, au service en français et je pense que ça, c'est au bénéfice des francophones de la province. OK. Um, uh, Rudy et Étienne, on vous revient, mais uh, um, I'd like to just uh, go to a couple other questions. Um, Sne Dugald of um, uh, Queen's Park Briefing, are you there? Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, Mr. Jibay, thanks for taking our questions. Um, I wanted to ask you about the new Child and Youth Unit. Um, early last fall, your office had um, said that you weren't having as many youth calling as, as you'd like, um, and that you were making efforts to reach out to them. So your report, now it mentions um, about 236 calls from young people, but a majority are still from adults, over 1,400. Um, so, it, I mean, is that a concern for you, and how confident Are you that you're reaching all the young people who, who need your office's help in the province? Well, I'm confident that we're making every effort to do that. We have a uh, tremendous amount of energy de dedicated to our outreach. Uh, my understanding was that in the past, uh, there were more adults contacting uh, the advocate's office than children for, for complaints. Um, that's my understanding. I could be corrected on that. So we've had 1,775 complaints. Uh, this year, I think that's a pretty substantial number. And what we've done is, is, is really work hard to ensure our accessibility, especially during the pandemic. So uh, we made sure that people had cell phones, that, that people could reach us, were active on social media. So um, yeah, I think, you know, I think we're, 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 we're accessible. People are reaching us and um, we're, we're actively engaged. 
and, and making sure that they have a voice. I mean, you know, the bottom line here is we're committed to ensuring that children and youth are heard and their rights are respected. Um, and whether it's an adult or a youth that brings that situation to our attention, uh, we act on it. Okay, thank you. Um, and one of the other things mentioned in your report is numbers on um, deaths or serious bodily harm or children who are receiving services from children's aid societies. Um, so there's reports related to, I think it was 122 deaths and then over 1400 cases of, of serious um, bodily harm. I know this is a new area for your office, but can you put those numbers into context for us? How surprising were those figures? Um, can you provide any more details on, um, on those numbers, areas of the province, um, and are any investigations being done in, into those figures? I, I don't have that information on my fingertips, and maybe we can get you some, some further information. My understanding is that those numbers are pretty consistent. Um, you know, there's not been a, a large spike or drop in those numbers over the years. Um, I was surprised when I first learned uh, about the numbers that, you know, that, that the amount of children uh, or youth deaths in the province um, has been fairly stable, but they're not all due to, um, you know, traumatic circumstances. Some of them are, 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 are health issues. So um, if, if you want to follow up, we can get you maybe more information on that, but I don't, I don't have those breakdowns at my, at my fingertips right now. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, uh, Randy Rath, are you uh, from CHCH? Do you have any questions? Are you there? Uh, I can't seem to unmute you, so. All right. Alors comme ça, j'entends à Rudy Chaban de TFO en effet. Si vous êtes toujours là, non, unmute. Voilà. Rudy, allez-y. Oh, allez-y. Rudy. Oui, allô Oui, monsieur Dubé, oui. bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez Oui. Bonjour. Euh, J'aurais euh, trois petites questions. Euh, la première, c'est que, donc, euh, c'est concernant les, les services en français. On voit que les, les, le, le nombre de, de plaintes a diminué euh, euh, sur euh, ces dernières années, sur les deux derniers exercices. À quoi est-ce que vous attribuez cette baisse Est-ce que les, les franco-ontariens... Euh, euh, sont, ont, ont moins de plaintes à poser ou est-ce que c'est peut-être plus compliqué pour eux de s'adresser à, à une instance de, euh, de, de, de dernier recours? Ce n'est pas du tout difficile pour déposer une plainte. En fait, c'est peut-être plus facile que jamais. Nous avons une expertise, nous avons une équipe pour recevoir des plaintes, donc c'est très facile. Euh, les nombres sont un peu plus ou moins consistants. Euh, je pense que le, le moyen était 300 11 par année euh, et le chiffre actuel, c'est 321 cette année. Donc, seulement c'est une hausse euh, de nombre de plaintes. Euh, une, une autre question concernant le… Donc, j'ai lu que dans le rapport, 52 des, des cas étaient réglés en une semaine, c'est bien ça. Oui. Et euh, 64 en deux semaines, qu'en est-il pour les… les, les tout ce qui touche au, au service en français, vous pourriez me donner, vous avez une indication sur en combien de temps une plainte est, est, est réglée, un cas est réglé? Non, on les, ne on les divise pas par, par unité ou par section. Ça, c'est pour l'ensemble du bureau. Donc, en fait, vous, il n'est pas possible de savoir si une plainte en français est traitée aussi rapidement qu'une qu plainte euh, liée à autre chose? Oui, oui. C est, c est, moi, je ne peux pas vous dire ça euh, présentement. Je n'ai pas ces, dé, ces détails. Euh, concernant le budget, j'ai vu que votre budget était de 33 millions de dollars et vos dépenses de 23 millions de dollars. Euh, le, le différentiel, c'est quoi? Ça, ça veut dire qu'il y, y, y a 10 millions qui n'ont pas été utilisés euh, à leur plein potentiel. Est-ce que vous pouvez m'expliquer un petit peu ça? 
Juste parce que tout, tous les postes ne sont pas datés. Euh, donc, le, le budget est en prévision de, de remplir tous les postes. Euh, le budget que nous avons proposé l'année dernière était de quoi, 30, 30 millions 468, qui était proche de 6 millions de moins que les trois bureaux ensemble l'année précédente. Euh, on vient de commencer notre exercice euh, fiscal le 1er avril, donc c'est trop tôt pour tirer des conclusions pour cette année. Juste une, une dernière petite précision concernant ma première question. Euh, vous disiez tout à l'heure qu'il qu n'y avait pas de différence entre le, 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 la nouvelle formule du commissariat et l'ancienne, mais vous me confirmez bien que… Euh, la, la commissaire Burke évolue dans, un, dans une instance de, de dernier recours, contrairement à avant. Le dernier recours, écoutez, ça, ça c'est, on peut en parler longtemps sur le dernier recours. Techniquement, le, 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 le ombudsman est un bureau des derniers recours, mais on n'exige pas le dernier recours quand ça ne fait pas de sens de faire attendre des gens. Et on est très proactif. Écoutez, on est un bureau de dernier recours pour les services correctionnels aussi, mais on rencontre le ministère du Solicitor General à, 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 à tous les trois mois pour trouver des, des enjeux, pour partager des données, pour être proactif à régler des problèmes systémiques. Donc, c'est la même chose pour les services en français. Um, donc, on invite toujours les gens d'essayer de, de régler une plainte en première instance parce que habituellement L'organisme a les documents, s'il si y a la possibilité de régler une plainte rapidement, efficacement, habituellement, c'est chez l'organisme dont on fait la plainte. Mais si, si, si ça ne se fait pas, on est là pour régler le problème. Mais des fois, ce n'est pas pratique d'exiger de, que les gens passent à travers le processus. Donc, ça, la décision est faite cas par cas. Merci. Merci, c'était tout. Merci. Linda, est-ce qu'on a d'autres questions? Do we have other questions, Linda? So I'm not getting any more questions and I'm not seeing Linda. No, I don't think we have any other questions. It's Emmanuel speaking here. Um, I don't think uh, we have any other questions. So I think that's that's it for today. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your interest. Have a good summer.